morning to some of you. Good evening to some of you. Actually, we are broadcasting to the entire world. So welcome so much to this session. We'll start soon because it's really now it's quite close to 11 UAE time, eight o'clock in Denmark. I'm broadcasting out of uh, Denmark today. So uh, actually uh, we are soon ready to start this live event, uh, Win More Orders. I hope you all joined here today. Uh, we have a lot of people coming in still and uh, we'll now be heading on for the next like short hour, uh, intensive hour for all of you. My name is Matt Swender and I'm so happy to welcome you here to Win More Orders. Win More Orders, it might seem a crazy title because everybody in sales are trying to win more orders. Maybe some of you even uh, enjoying happy times right now where you were winning orders, but maybe don't knowing why. Uh, or some of you are struggling and want to win more orders and trying desperate to do something, but you really don't know what to do because what you're trying is not really succeeding. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to introduce you to a, a, a kind of a tool, uh, a kind of a structure, a kind of a method to get your sales more repeatable. That means you can actually repeat what you're doing that works. You can scale it. That means you can grow because we know when we grow, we need some structure to scale it. And then by most important thing uh, by far is that you can make it profitable. Profitable meaning not only, not only results, uh, money in the bank, but also happy customers and happy salespeople. Because these two things are actually more long lasting, more sustainable things to achieve. Happy customers will make you uh, pr profitable for a longer time and motivated salespeople. That is what every man or woman uh, leading a sales and marketing department want motivated people. So welcome so much. Let's get started right now. Very often when I hear somebody talk about a playbook, they get bored because they think what you're gonna have is a lot of scripts, it's a lot of structure, and it's some kind of a method that you cannot do anything else than the playbook. Then I can tell you by far from the beginning that you have misunderstood totally the concept of a playbook because the playbook is not limiting you. It's actually giving you opportunities to grow, repeat, scale, and do it profitable. So we'll just start out with actually the story of a playbook because it's, under, it's important, sorry, I uh, just have to put my window back here. Uh, it's important to understand the, the, the history behind the playbook. The story comes from a world of very performance oriented people. It comes from sport. Because what you do in sport is the coach, especially when you talk about uh, American football, when you talk about soccer in Europe, when you talk even about cricket in Pakistan, India, England, Australia, we talk about a playbook. And what is a playbook? There are different things in a playbook. Actually, when you go to the NFL and the US, the American football, you have a playbook for the entire league that tells everything about the situation, the games, how you play it. And every coach produce, distribute, and conduct with his own playbook. That is the way his team is playing. So he has structured all the tactics of the game. He has structures all the systems they are playing, offensively playing, defensively playing. That means the entire game is structured in a playbook that he hands out to his team. He introduced them to the way he wants them to play. So whether you're a fullback or quarterback or whatever you're playing, you know exactly what we do in different situations. That means you're practicing, you're improving this system and you understand it. If you go to football, European football, the most successful coaches around the world have playbooks. And the minute they integrate a new player, they work with these playbooks because it is the first handout they give to these players, understand the way we are playing. This is the way we, that is the way we approach the game. This is the way we, we do our things in the game. And why, why do they actually do this? First of all, they have a special, like a, a way they want to be seen. This is the game, how, we, how I believe we can win, but also what I want people to enjoy when they see us. And every time they get new players, what do they do? They start introducing them to the playbook, the system, because with the playbook, they can actually produce game plans for each game, 
and even they can pre prevent small more sprint battles in the game. Meaning that in this and this and this, we need to win, to win the game, to win the season and win the trophy. And very interesting is every time somebody joins a team, they don't necessarily start playing even their big start, uh, even their big stars, they don't start playing from the beginning. One example here, some of you probably know about uh, the, the great uh, football player Messi, joined Paris Saint-Germain from Barcelona. Did he start in the 11th start, starting line from the beginning? No, he was on the bench. He played some minutes. Why? Because he needed to adapt to the system. He needed to adapt to the team. And the team, of course, needed to adapt him into the team. So here we're talking about a playbook. And I can ask you, or you can ask yourself, if somebody arrived in your sales department, how do you actually introduce them to the way you sell? To the tools, the method, the approach to the market, the, the way he has support? No, I think you all know it. Normally somebody arrives, they've been selling before. So you think that you bought somebody who knows how to sell and then you just integrate them by saying, here is your region, here is your list of customers, go and get some profit. That's not the way to make them successful. And now we are exactly addressing why a sales playbook is really, really good sense. What we see is very interesting. As you see here, to work with a playbook, first of all, what you see is that playbook, companies that integrate a playbook in the sales and marketing department, they are more likely to be high performance in their business. Why? Because again, they know exactly how they go to the market. They know what they do. And just like the coach, when you know what you do, you can evaluate, you can adjust, you can improve. If you don't know what you're doing, you can just see that you have bad results. You don't know what behavior you need to change. You don't, you did, you don't see where you succeeded. So actually the playbook defines also that it's easier to make success repeatable and changeable and adjustable. Then secondly, what you see is companies working with, with their playbooks they have better win rates than other companies. Better win rates mean that in, in companies where you maybe you win three out of 10 orders, companies working with the playbook, they have win rates about 50%. Of course, in every industry, they are different because in some industries you can win 80 out of 100, or in some you can only win 30 out of 100, but we see generally that people working with playbooks have better win rates. And then very interesting, all around the globe, we see today that B2B salespersons, actually it's a little critical because only like around 50% of B2B sales guys and girls achieve their target. That means only one out of two achieve actually their budget. What we see is when you work with a playbook, a lot more people achieve their budget. That means they reach the target. I told you about having happy customers, but I also told you about having motivated salespeople. Does it motivate a sales guy when he achieves his target? Yes, for sure. So if you want to help your sales organization, then make sure that you, I'll just make this a little bigger here for you. Make sure that you work with a sales player because you will be a high performer or you have the option to be a high performer in your business you have better win rates because we see that two out of three companies that follow a safe playbook exceed 50% of win rate. And then of course we see that in companies following a playbook, we have significant larger proportion of safe people in the companies reaching their target. So there's no reason not to, jo to join and work with a playbook. And then we have even more benefits here because today we actually see there are four things here that are very important. First of all, time to sell. Today, we see that a lot of salespeople only have like around 30 to 35% of their time selling. When we work with the playbook, we have an option to get them more time to sell, more FaceTime, whatever FaceTime is on the phone, on Teams, Zoom, or face to face. We have more time with them because we can design it and we can define it. And things are changing today in B2B selling. That means if they work like they did two years ago, they're probably working in a wrong, wrong way. So we need to change something. And if we design it in a playbook, we have an option to measure and adjust. So we can actually create more time for selling. Secondly, 
when we get new salespeople, it's much easier to train them because we know what they should actually do. And a lot of sales guys, uh, maybe some of you even tried it. You, you join the new company. You were the king in your old company. Now you are expected to be a crown prince in the new company, but you arrive. And in some ways they do differently. You don't really succeed in the first weeks or month and you feel frustrated. You get desperate and you're trying to do what you did before, but it doesn't work because you're in a new industry. You're in a new company. And even when you come from a small company to go to a big company, you need to adjust to habits. You need to adapt the way of working. And if you have a playbook, it's easier to integrate and make people faster, successful. And they like to, uh, to do that because then they have motivation and they really feel that now I'm engaging with what I need to do. And then you see, today we see that sales is no longer a one-man game. It's a team game. We need to integrate uh, marketing, pre-sales, sales, after sales, service, whatever. And what you really see with the playbook is that you, you actually manufacture the way we work, the way we sell. And then you can actually do your sales process your approach to the market, you can actually be more successful in what is called S-marketing. S-marketing is the, the coordination between sales and marketing. Make these two teams work together will achieve more than if they work apart in silos. And then the last part, very interesting. Going back to the sports coach again, he wants to learn what actually works. We know that in sport, they work with data. But if we are learning from our best salespeople because we have a way to sell and we can actually learn what they're doing to integrate the way they're doing it in the playbook, then we can actually also make it transmit to other salespeople. And that's actually interesting because if we analyze what they're doing, the tactics, they share the insights, they share what they're actually doing out there, the best moments, then you'll be able to replicate it, scale it, and repeat it and put it to the entire sales organization. So by saying this, we really see that there are a lot of reasons to have a sales playbook. What I'll do now for the next 40 minutes is, I'll introduce you to some uh, main areas about uh, the, the sales playbook. I'll just give you a, a touch of the structure because I know if you're looking at a sales playbook, for sure, there is only one or actually two reasons to do this. The main reason to do it is that you want to create results. You want to create some results, whatever it's market share, uh, win more orders, have more profit. That's actually what you're heading for. To do this, you need to create customer experience. Customer experience means that customers meet your salespeople at the right time, your salespeople are relevant, they are valuable, and they are actually showing the customers that my company is the, that the one you have to choose to have the best supplier. To do this, we have three things we need to work with because results only comes when we see that customers like our product, see the value, and actually enjoy being together with our organization. We have three things we can work with. That's actually also what we integrate in the playbook. First of all, we have our strategy. Strategy is our approach to the market. It's our segmentation. It's our rotation. It's our position. Where do we actually want to position ourselves in the market? What is actually, what should the, the, the customers experience when they see us? So what we define here is actually our way of playing if we look at sport. This is how we play football. This is how we do sailing. This is the approach we have. This is the target group, the segmentation, and this is actually what they should experience. This is designed in a desktop session. It's written down, and then we have to integrate it down in the experience of the customers. But if you don't design it, how should your salespeople then be capable and able to do exactly what you want to? And if I interview some of your salespeople and they don't say the same about what kind of experience you want to show customers, how can you then make sure that you actually create what they want to see? So here it's very important to make sure that you actually do the entire foundation of do selling. And I'm so lucky to be connected to a lot of sales scientists. And it actually shows in those companies who do not align our sales and marketing, who do not align our sales approach, they are less successful. 
But if you're lying and you actually make people feel they understand our position, you're more successful. Secondly, to do this, now you define what you want to do. Now you need to structure and build processes. Processes means that you actually now organize your sales in the right way and you build, symbolized by this, you build processes for what we do. These processes are from the beginning, before selling, marketing, pre-sales, selling, after sales, follow up, creating loyalty. It is so important to build this structure because that's where you create the successful handover, the coordination, working together, and all this here will create the best customer experience. So what we talk about now is what do we want people to see and how should we actually do it? And then our job is to get this from strategic, tactical to operational level. Operational level means that we integrate it in our culture. That's actually where this from strategy and structure and process will face reality. It will face reality when it goes into the culture. This is what people think, feel, and how they act. The minute we get it into head, heart, and hand with the people here, we get it into the experience and customers will say, wow, this is amazing. And then you will see results will raise. So now we actually have the structure of a playbook. The structure of a playbook is, it will actually make the sweet spot of strategy, structure process and culture or behavior. This is also a call for change because in a lot of companies, and now you can just ask yourself, what are your most important KPIs? Most of you will probably see results, maybe effort or activity, but here we are back to the most important KPI may be changed to a KPI, not the P, but the B. What is that? That is behavior. Because if you want to create better results, we are talking about behavior. We're talking about how can I actually make my people do the right stuff to create the best result? And how can I evaluate and give them feedback and develop them if I don't know what I want them to do? So learn from the best, learn from sport, learn from actors, learn from people around the world that actually want to create this. You could also learn this about the playbook from any big band in the world of music. They have playbooks for the concerts. They know exactly what to do because that can make them go beyond when it really matters for them. So now we talk about this. I'll go back to my slide here just to show you because what we actually have to see here is that these are the elements. And of course, for those of you interested, uh, this session will both be recorded and it's also uh, possible to get uh, my slides, my handout, uh, you'll get that. My good friend and colleague Mark is here and they're doing this session a couple of times. We'll have a, give a couple of giveaways. And the first one is actually coming uh, very shortly because there are three easy steps to get started. First of all, build a sales and marketing playbook. Don't build it too big. I'll come back to that, but get the job started. Don't expect you to finish building, but get started. And then you are working with it because you have to do the second part, keep it up updated. And then the third part, create and show value in the sales playbook. Because if you do that, people in your company will, will see the value of the playbook. You will actually develop it. You will put the content in it and putting in that content, make it even more valuable and more accessible because when people see value, they will actually use it. So here are the steps. And if you want help to this, Mark will share a link because we actually have a option for you to, uh, to download a very easy way to get started. I didn't say finished. I said, get started, get moving with the playbook. So Mark will share with you in the chat, I think, uh, a link where you can actually have a free uh, template for building a repeatable, scalable and profitable sales playbook. So you can get started working with this. I can see that Mark already did it and that's for you. And let's get started now with how do we actually build? And I'll show you here example of the content of a playbook. This is just to show you 10 things that could be in the content list of a playbook. First of all, I would definitely put in a short company description because remember, this is for new salespeople. So if they arrive, they should know a little about the history. History creates culture, it creates brands. So of course they should know something about what's actually going on in our company. 
They should know about our philosophy and our method. We talked about the approach to the market. That's how we do it. This is our philosophy. I'll come back to that in a minute because this is a very important part. This is exactly like the coach. How do we play football? How do we play when we play offense? How do we play when we play defense? And you should actually define it because if you define it, it's easier to distribute. It's easier to train new people and it's easier to make sure that you can work with it every day. Then number three, ideal customer profile. That might not only be one profile, it might be more profiles, but having ideal pro customer profiles, that is a way of doing our segmentation. We are, we are heading for this kind of companies if we want to, if we want to address uh, the, the right customers. We want to achieve these. We could, even, we could even put in not only ideal customer profile, but also buyer personas, putting in who are the most important people we want to speak with, depending on, on the, the, the customer's buying process. So actually what you do here is, you identify the most ideal customers you want to sell to. Maybe they fit your product. Maybe they're more profitable. Maybe they're easy to sell to. And then you can even address the buyer personas you want to, to go to. We all know that a lot of salespeople only speak to one or two persons in any organization. But we also know the fact that in B2B selling, there's an average a little, a little less than seven people in, involved in making these decisions. So if you only... If you only speak to one or two of them in the organization, there are five, six, seven, eight people making influence on decisions, maybe even taking decisions, but you don't speak to them. So defining the ideal customer profile and the buyer personas is a very important thing. Then map your sales process. We come back to that a little later, because if we define our process, we have an option to evaluate, change, adjust, but if we never map it, how should we then be able to evaluate? How should we be able to adjust? That is totally impossible because something that is not defined cannot be evaluated. Then we just work in like a blindfolded, just heading around in like snow is in our eyes. So we need to map that sales process. KPI and goals, maybe write down what are the most important KPIs and what goals are we heading for? Uh, because if we all know them, we can repeat them because the playbook should be a live working tool that we have in any interaction in the sales department, sales and marketing department, we work with the playbook. So KPIs and goals, write them down, maybe adjust them, even during the session, during the season, change them a little, but write them down. Now, as you see on the left side, we have a little more like the strategic approach, the tactical approach. Then we go into the right side where it's more operational. Unique selling points. How often do you actually practice and conclude and discuss your unique selling points? Yeah, I'm right, not enough. So in a playbook, you must have an area discussing unique selling points. There must be an agenda for this because if you all the time repeat and work with this, your people will be more, know, know, the knowledge will be better about unique selling points, but also practicing how to communicate it to the, to the clients. How do we actually tell clients what are our unique selling points? And if you integrate marketing, Marketing should know as well, because if marketing don't know our unique selling points, how could they actually communicate our messages uh, when they lead generate, when they do lead automation? They have no option to address the market in the right way if they don't know our sales philosophy and if they don't know our unique selling points. So doing this job is not something you should do by yourself. You should do it together with your sales people, with your marketing, to make sure that everybody in your organization understands this. Even if you're, if you're really ambitious, then even reception service people, try to imagine you're selling a machine. The machine is sold and now your service people is coming to do the installation. And then the client asks you, oh, we're so happy to buy this, but I'm a little, I'm a little doubt. What is actually the, the best thing about your product, your machines? If sales, sorry, if service people don't know that, what should they say then? Of course, they should know our unique selling points. And if you don't train them, how could they use, then know it? So it's a very important job to make sure that anybody in the company knows our unique selling points and are proud about it. Because if you create more proudness, you get a stronger culture. Number seven, objection handling. Objection handling is maybe what I call the, the most important discipline, uh, the most important discipline for any salesperson. We get afraid when we see objections very often because we're afraid that we don't get the order. But it's totally wrong. Objections is a natural thing in any in any sales conversation. 
Just like if you play football, it's mm. obvious that somebody will tackle you or try to make it impossible for you to pass the ball. So actually objection handling is just like making people understand what do we do when we play football and somebody put pressure, then we do like this and this and this. Objection handling the same. And you should be able to handle the most natural, most basic objection without any problem. More specific objections we need to practice and learn. But ask yourself again, how often do you actually practice objection handling? Probably very, very rare. So what you should do here is put it in the playbook and then you can work with it. Then I put in some very tactical tools, actually, scripts. When I see the best playbooks in the world, they have a lot of scripts. These scripts can be from the beginning, what kind of LinkedIn messages will I put if I contact a person on LinkedIn? What could I put in my first email contact to a customer? How do I actually call on a cold call canvas concept? What is the concept or the structure of a first meeting? What is the structure of presenting proposals? What is the follow-up call script? What is the onboarding process? That means you create a lot of scripts that will make it easier for new people to be integrated in your way of playing. So if you do this, these scripts, they're not to make everybody do exactly the same. It's a kind of a, a, a level that makes it actually possible to have a higher level of uh, behavior in organ organization. And when we, when we get a little tired or we need inspiration, it's very obvious that we address these scripts and speak about it and read them. And of course, what we see today is a lot of salespeople are spending a lot of time to, to uh, actually get content to contact uh, some of the, 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 the people they have, uh, sorry, the customers they, they are addressing. And, and if you are trying to find a content and don't know where to find it, you'll spend a lot of time, you actually waste a lot of time. So scripts, contents is to make inspiration and make a higher level. And then we can speak about tools and technologies. What kind of tools are we using in our organization? CM system, uh, lead automation, uh, outbound systems, uh, all these kind of tools that we use, presenting systems. Uh, how do we actually use them? Because if everybody knows them and how we use them, we, we, we do it the same way. So of course it's natural to tell what kind of systems bind us together. And then I would nat naturally put down our daily, weekly, monthly, yearly routines. That could be like uh, every week, every day, uh, all salespeople put in a short list of the best activities. Every week we have a short session, one-to-one, uh, -one, uh, the sales leader and the sales guys, uh, a 10 minute uh, brief, the best things from the week, uh, the biggest challenge, uh, pipeline meeting. Maybe you have a weekly pipeline uh, sessions. Maybe you have monthly pipeline sessions. Maybe you have quarterly meetings with everybody. You put in your routines because we all know having routines make us more efficient. We don't need to think about it. And these routines are very important also for new people when they arrive. So they know, okay, this is the way we do here. Routines create our habits. Habits make us efficient unless uh, we don't know how we can change it. So again, if you want to get started with this, Mark just shared for you the link where you can have this scalable, repeatable, and profitable free sales temp uh, template for sales playbook that is uh, accessible for you if you want to have that one. So what we'll do now is we'll actually go down a little deeper into three areas, very shortly go into three areas to tell you a little about what's actually here in this region. First of all, on a strategic level, I want to approach you. How can you define the way you sell? Here we're talking about sales philosophy. Sales philosophy, mean, sales philosophy means our way of selling. When we look upon this, this is just like the football coach, my way of playing football. Some are more defensively, some are more playing in offense, there are different ways of playing. Some want to be in position with the, the, the ball. Some wants to get rid of it and put pressure. We have all these moments, exactly like selling. And if you look at selling, selling is not just selling. We have some different options here. Selling can be very transactional. This is not about good or bad selling. This is actually just a way of selling. Transactional selling means that we focus on 
speaking with a client, presenting a product, selling a product, receiving money. Very orderly, very one-way stream, very process-oriented, and of course, a lot of activities. Transactional selling can even be for big brands. But what we do here is we make a very, very seamless uh, process. We make it very easy to buy, and we make it very, very transactional. So a lot of effort, and of course, a lot of this will also be online uh, selling, meaning that we can have, of course, salespeople going out selling transactional, but then we gather information, keep on speaking with the with the, um, the client, and proposing new products, uh, selling for the next time. Transactional selling means that we have to design a very smooth a very scalable and very repeatable transactional sales process. On the other hand, we have what is called co-creation. This is a much more loose process, meaning that we haven't defined exactly how we want to do everything, and we are not focused on the same measuring, the same KPIs, where we here want to measure every day, what did we sell, how many meetings. Here we're measuring more to the process move ahead. Do we actually continue moving? Uh, we speak much more together with the client. We're not, the product is not defined, solution is not defined. We do it actually together with the clients. Over here, products are firm, they are structured. Here, we can actually design and meet the client and even sometimes work together with competitors, other suppliers. It's a much more, a much more creative environment. That's actually the difference here. And that means this one is, still repeatable, but not in the same way. It's maybe not scalable in the same way, and maybe that the time for order is longer than the process here where we can win daily or weekly. Here we maybe win uh, monthly or yearly. That means we have to define, to make people understand that in general, we have three paradigms, approaches to selling. We have what is called the product approach. The product approach means that we are presenting products and we are presenting value of the product. We should be aware that we shouldn't get into a price competition, but that can obviously happen, but the value is created from the product. And it's very much about presenting product, feature and value. So here also for marketing, it's important to understand this is our approach to the market. Second part is we have solution selling. Solution selling is actually more focused on really understanding the need of the customer, uncovering need, activating need, and presenting solutions. So that means where we have the approach that product is important, then need get more important. That means we really want to understand the need of the customer. We can also activate needs, meaning that we can bring valuable insights, we can challenge them a little. And then we see that the, op that the different option here is product is more fixed, here it's the need we're addressing and presenting solution that can help people not to lose or not to, to, to uh, or to gain. That means I'm here actually to solve your problem. And, and the more I go here, the more I get insights because over here, I'm more addressing insights and more challenging people. That means here I tell you this product is great for you. Here I tell you, I talk about your needs and what actually keeps you awake at night. And the more I go here, I'll, I'll also tell you what should keep you awake at night. That means I'm, I'm totally changing here because value comes from product, value comes from solution or needs, and here value comes from insights and conversation. That means, as you can see here, it's very obvious, it's not the same sales person. This is much more high activity. This is more conversation, more coaching, actually. That means more patience, more activity, and in the middle is more trying to understand the need. This means also that we have different ways. Uh, I talked about philosophy, but we can also talk about our method. How should we actually work? How should we train? How should we practice? And of course, if you practice here, you are much more persuading people to buy. You're much more telling about features. So here it's actually learning product, learning feature, and really understanding how can I persuade in a good way people to take my product. Over here, it's really understanding need analysis. It's maybe working with a spin concept, 
where you can actually ask the same questions again and again and address them, ask for what will be the consequence if you don't do like this? What is your benefit from doing? What is the need you have here? And then when we go here, it's more open. It's much more like a coaching part uh, that you are actually not, you don't have the solution in mind. You have in mind that you want actually to, to change something. It's maybe even you're addressing a purpose. So what you see here is if you train people the same way, you don't get success. But a lot of companies don't define this. And what you see is when you're gonna hire a new person and you have actually, let's try to make an example. We have defined that we want to be in this area. We want to use spin and we want to uncover needs, activate needs. And then you go and hire a new guy. You get a, an application from somebody who is really successful, but they're successful in product selling. And then they arrive in your organization because you hired them because of results. And then they start working, but they have no success. Because the way in your approach to the market, the customers, the ideal customer profile you are addressing is here. So what they are doing now is they are successful now. And this unsuccessful sales guy, then you will tell he's a bad salesperson, but he's not. You did the mistake in your recruitment that you hired the wrong person to do the job you wanted them to do. So if you really want to hire the right persons, if you want to make your marketing successful, you start by understanding what is our philosophy, what is our method, you define it, and you put it into your playbook. I'll just give you a short example here. And of course, as I said to you, these are how you can actually make your sales philosophy. Here you see the paradigms. You have the purpose value on the right side, the product value on the left, and then the middle solution. And that means there are different ways of selling. Here is an example of how you align it with the sales method and the communication we just talked about. If you're more spend selling and value-based or you're going to write for the co-creation, then we're talking about what kind of question we're asking, the approach we have to the customer. And here's an example of one of my customers, how you can actually in a one page define your philosophy. This one will actually be very interesting whenever you're recruiting, developing or aligning, then you could put in here, this is our way of doing and this, this company is called Xmaster, how we sell. They are telling about how they want to inspire, be a little provocative. They're telling how they actually combine digital and sales and marketing. This is the first step in your sales playbook. I hope this makes sense for you. In case uh, some of you are thinking, oh, how can I take my next step? You are so lucky that today, uh, Mark and I are giving away five workshops. That means five of you can be the lucky person to have a workshop to get started working with a sales playbook. Not, not heavily working, but uh, successfully working. So if you want to sign up for uh, uh, a workshop with us, five of you will be the lucky uh, winners of a, a workshop. Mark will send you now a form or link that you can sign up, say, oh, yes, I'm happy. I'll be happy to have a workshop, and we'll come back to you. But unfortunately, uh, normally there's a lot of people signing up. And we are, we are only uh, capable of, of giving away five of these. So this was the first step. This was the sales philosophy, the strategic part. Now we'll just address another part. And I'll just uh, show you my slide here because now we'll address the sales process. Normally what I see is that people are doing the sales process without understanding the customer journey. And I'll come back to this customer journey in a minute. Normally what I see is that people define the sales process and that is a very important thing. And I'll give you an example here because sales is a numbers game. It is a numbers game, especially if you're more transactional, but it's a number game anyway. But what I normally see is that people put up here saying, our sales process is to get one order. We need to go backwards and say, oh, we have a second meeting where we present a proposal. We have a first meeting in which we uncover needs and get to know the customer, present our company. Then we take a contact to book a meeting, whether it's online or physically. Before having that contact, we have a lead list that is maybe generated by our marketing. And then I very often ask people, first of all, what is your average order? Let's take an example here. Average order is today 10,000 US dollars. And then I ask them to get one order, how many second meetings do you need? What are your win rates in second meetings? 
Very often when I ask this, a lot of people say, we don't really know. And then let's just take an example. You're winning every third order, every third proposal you win. Presenting three proposals, you win one order. Then I ask, what does it take to have one amazing second meeting? How many first meetings you need? I'm not just talking about I want to put pressure on second meetings, but a meeting where I really uncover needs, understood, and people say, wow, could you come and present a proposal for us because we want to do this? And then just not take an example. I need three amazing first meetings to get the second meeting. Already now you see what is an impressive first meeting? What is an amazing proposal? What is a great second meeting? You see that if we have defined this in the playbook, this is the way we do. It's easier actually to evaluate and develop. So what we talk about here is one order needs three second meetings, one good second meeting needs three first meetings, and to get one first meeting, I might need to contact five people, five companies. What you see now is you actually need on your lead list, you need one multiplied by three, multiplied by three, multiplied by five, you need 45 leads to win one order. That's why it's a numbers game, because now you know your efficiency. You know that if you keep on doing this to win 1 million, if that was the budget, then I need to win 100 orders. Then I need 4,500 leads. And now you give up. So what we need to do here is, first of all, we could focus on, could I get a higher average order? by doing with ideal customer profile? Could I change something and make it possible to go down maybe to two, two and three by being more quality focused, more focused on the content, more focused on the meetings. Then I'll have one multiplied by two, by two, by three. Then we're actually down to 12 leads to win one order. Then I don't need the same situation. But this, if I don't know what we're doing today, normally what will happen is, and I know you sales managers out there, what you will do is if you're under pressure, you will, you will take the whip and then you'll say, move on, do more activity. But what we get now is you get shit in, shit out. You get more activities, but it doesn't help. You get demotivated salespeople. So first of all, you need to understand your sales process. You need to define what are we actually doing? How are the calls? and then you can evaluate. If you don't do this, you're not a sales manager, you're just a boss. So what we're actually seeing here is this process then need to be aligned with one of the most important things. That's what I do now, I'll share my slide here. It needs to be aligned with the customer's journey. And what is a customer journey? Just a short definition. Customer journey is the first time a customer meets our brand name or company until the end of the journey, the day they forget us forever. In that process, we have on the left side, the new customers, on the right side, existing customers. And what's happening here is, the first time we meet them, we trigger them, something happened, they get to know us. Uh, we trigger them maybe with a LinkedIn post, we trigger them with an email direct, we trigger them with a call, we trigger them with something that make them feel, okay, this company is interesting. The problem is that they are not ready to buy yet. But sometimes we try to buy, we try even to book a meeting. And what it's doing now is I'm, wait, I'm wasting my meetings. So maybe we need to address them later because we need to put them into a process where they are considering our company. In that process, we can feed them by a blog post, a webinar, live events. And when they get more aware of this, then they will be, and they're ready to buy, they start understanding they need to buy, they'll be in an active evaluation. In that active evaluation, they'll get ready to purchase, ready to make a decision. In that purchase decision, when they buy, we have to onboard them and make them experience because now they're getting to be existing customers. Then we onboard them to be successful customers. And then we follow up, we create loyalty, we speak with them. And then when we created the loyalty, we will hopefully not lose them because they will buy more, they'll buy different stuff. And they will even go out and say to other people, you should join this company. This community of the company here is amazing. This is our supplier. You should have the same partner. So what we're actually talking about are some steps. What do the client do in these steps? 
And if we want to understand this and we want to design our sales process, we need to do like this. Here are the same six steps. The trigger, the consideration, the outreach or the uh, where they're evaluating, the purchase decision, experience and loyalty. So what we can define here is what are our activities that we offer to the customer at that time? And then you see in the beginning, it's only some post on LinkedIn, it's some advertising, it's maybe in the next step, they can download a guide or it's a webinar or a live event. And then we're getting on, maybe we introduce the product in the outreach, we can introduce it, we have meetings online, offline, and then we can go there, offer um, our proposal based on their needs. Maybe we do reference uh, visits, they see somebody who's using our product, and then we focus on the onboarding plan. And then we see, in the end, we will show them documentation, how they actually uh, created value working with us. And of course, when we define our activities, we define the entire steps that we want to do to make sales more efficient. We put on a responsible person. Here I put again the company X Master. X Master is here putting on who is responsible. And what you see now is we're starting out with marketing being responsible. And I'll just go back. Marketing being responsible for the first steps. They have to trigger customers. They have to make them consider us. And the minute marketing get leads, then in the second step, sales will take over, qualify leads, take contact, start speaking to them, get in contact, get meetings, make them buy in the purchase decision, make them buy, uncover their needs, present proposals. And then the minute sales has done their selling, they will transfer to after sales service and somebody will be responsible for doing the installation or getting them onboarded. Customer success manager takes over. And then there might, might be a salesperson who is responsible for keep on having the contact, keep on reaching out, creating loyalty. And then in that minute, we get a much more longer released, lasting relationship. And then the wheel will turn on and turn on. A lot of companies think that the customer journey is the first time you speak and when they buy it and the journey ends. No, the journey keeps on. Retention is an important part of making customers buy again and again. And then of course, uh, if we understand this, we have defined who is actually responsible for what steps in all of these uh, positions here. So what you see now is, if we go back to this one, we have now designed our philosophy and method. This is the way we're selling. We have defined our process. We have seen the steps. We even know the numbers. We know how many meetings we have need to, to, to have to get a proposal. We need how many proposals and our win rates. We need to know our leverage order. So what we're actually doing here is we have the dashboard, the cockpit, the control tower for selling. We know direction, we know how to measure. Now we focus on the hands-on part, the uh, operational part, because now we need to train and practice our salespeople. And what is one part that is very interesting, we very often get is we get objections. Most salespeople, they get very scared, unsecure when they get, uh, very insecure when they get um, objections. So what we need here is we need to, we need to practice. And that's just like football, just like any discipline, we need to practice again and again to adapt, to learn, and to make a higher impact in everything we do. And just one example here. Let's say somebody's saying, your price is too high, you're too expensive. Normally most salespeople get under pressure because what they hear is your price is expensive. They don't hear your price is expensive. They hear, I'm not choosing you. Unfortunately, it's wrong because it's a mistake. The client didn't say, I'm not choosing you. The client just said, price is too high. In my mind, what I should actually think is, he's telling me, show me the value. Because if you can show me the value, I'll not feel prices too high, I'll not feel it's expensive. But mindset wise, most salespeople, they misunderstand. They think now we're gonna struggle, now we're gonna fight. And some will even answer what I call the most silly answer you can have. They say, when people, when your clients say, oh, your price is expensive, they'll just address it like this. Yeah, but quality cost. Our product is quality. This is a statement. This is not addressing the client. This is not understanding the client. So if you want to be the best in objection handling, 
you need to learn to understand to do the puff model. The puff model is a structure that you can practice in all your sales meeting. And the puff model is actually every time you have an objection, you need to meet it positively. Just acknowledge that it's there. Just say it's fair that you're addressing the investment. It's fair that you're addressing the price. But please let me understand what do you actually mean? What do you actually see? What is the point behind what you're seeing? I'm asking questions to uncover and understand what it what is actually your, not what you're saying, but what you mean. And what's happening here is the client will feel that, wow, he's actually understanding me. He's trying to understand what I'm saying. And what's happening now is that when I say, please tell me a little more about when you talk about expensive price or investment, what is in your mind? Give me some options about what is the what is the situation here? What do you compare with? What do you think about it? And then when I really uncover this, I can change their focus. I could ask a question like, okay, we focused on the price, but what is your benefit here? What do you see you'll gain from it? What does it mean to your, your return on investment? That means I can change focus from price to benefit, from try price to gain to value. And this is my job as a sales guy. But ask yourself, how often do you actually practice objection handling? You talk about it, but you cannot talk just like silly, like I talk about going to fitness. How much better condition and shape do you think you'll get in? Oh, I talk a lot about it. I even think about it. Yeah, but fitness is for doing. Fitness is not for thinking. So if you really want to learn objection handling, don't talk about it. Don't think about it. Practice. And I'll just show you here some example of how you can actually do this because everybody in your company should know how you handle objections. These objections should be put in your sales playbook and then you can write them down. You can write down how you'll meet them positively. You can write down how you'll examine and undercover and how you'll change focus. And then you have example like this, again, from the X master company. Your solution is too expensive. Okay, what is the problem here is they don't have an overview of all finances. They might think that they're not talking on total cost of ownership. They're just focusing on the first time price. So what we can do on the handling part is, actually, what do you mean by expensive solution? What do you see as a startup cost? What is the operating cost? I can ask all these questions. The minute you have this bank of objection handling, your organization will get stronger to do this. But ask yourself, do your organization know exactly how they should handle these objections? Do you practice them? No, probably not. So just to make sure that you understand now, this should be a part of your safe playbook. You should keep on updating it all the time. These 10 things that I put in, you'll get them in the free uh, playbook. If you're addressing that, most of these will be, be ready that you can start. And if you want to keep it updated, you need to make it alive. And how you make it alive here, you put your sales playbook on the agenda in any sales meeting internally. You gather marketing, after sales, pre-sales, sales, service, and then you speak about Actually, this could be an agenda just as inspiration for a sales and marketing meeting. Instead of talking about KPIs and results that everybody knows, let them know that before they're arriving. A lot of times salespeople arrive in a sales meeting, they all know, they all know that they're not doing good enough or that they are doing good. So instead of talking about old, old figures, meaning results, then talk about the, the future. Talk about how you can actually how do we work with our sales philosophy? Do we have some example of success? Experience what kind of ideal customer profile and buyer personas are the right ones to go with? Uh, get your learnings aligned with sales and marketing in the customer journey. What happened actually in lead generation? What works? Are people participating in our webinars? Do we actually convert from first line leads to second line to, to meetings? And then practice your uh, unique selling points and your objections and then define our must win battles for the coming period. This could be five steps in your agenda. Instead of addressing all these results, maybe doing a product presentation. Very often when you do a product presentation, you don't even practice how you'll present it and how you'll use it. So please get more operational, get on a lower level. Instead of just talking about fitness, then do fitness. Instead of talking about sales, do sell sales training. So in that, moment you start doing this, what will happen is that you will actually get a much more alive playbook. 
And my best advice for you is, if you really want to have this, here are the four things that you th should think about with your playbook. First of all, think it big, but build it small. This is meaning that you're actually building the road while you're driving. You have a vision for the playbook. You have a perspective, but you start building slowly and you build together. Engage your team in that. Don't do it by yourself. I see sometimes sales leaders sit down for six months, uh, design a playbook, and then they present it. There's no engagement. Let your people design it. Let them put in the content. They are closer to this than you are. So make them in, engage in this. Use it actually as I just presented for you in the sales meeting. And that means it's actually integrated and you get it to work. And then keep building, keep building, keep building. You never finished because you'll have to renovate, change because market is changing, process is changing, customer journey is changing. So all the time you need to do this. So just to summarize, a sales playbook is a necessary tool for any sales and marketing organization. You will, you will have an option to be the best in your industry. You'll win more, win, uh, you'll have better win rates uh, and actually you'll gain a, a stronger team, more to motivation, and you will put people together in the case you put on the sales playbook. So for all of you, I really hope you enjoyed this. Uh, maybe you got some other perspectives. I know it's just like 55 minutes of uh, information and hopefully inspiration and motivation. And then of course, as I said to you, five of you can be the lucky person to have a workshop. Uh, what all you need to do is put it under, the, uh, fill out the form as Mark sent to you. Uh, uh, and then, of course, you can have this uh, this presentation here. Fill out the form. You can have a workshop if you're logging one. And then in that workshop, gather the small team you want to gather. We do something like this. You get We get you started. And then hopefully you'll be successful with your playbook. Have a nice day out there. Work with your playbook and take your sales seriously because you're living for it. Have a nice day. Take care. Bye-bye.